Hello. My name is John Gordoner. I work on the, I'm a lead program manager on the Windows user experience team. My team's job for Windows 8.1 was to refine the Windows search experience. Now, you probably saw from the keynote, um, we did a lot of work. Um, we changed quite a bit. Um, and overall, it's gotten a pretty good reception. Um, I was looking at some articles this morning, and I saw that uh, Engadget called it stunning. Um, the Verge uh, said that it was really clear that Microsoft put a lot of thought into this experience, and it's clear that it paid off. Um, the reason I'm quoting that is not to show off. Um, it is that to reinforce that we did a lot of hard work. And the point of this talk is for me to tell you the story about that work so that it's really obvious and really easy to see how you can take advantage of that when building the search experience in your app. So I'm going to talk about three things. I'm going to talk about what search was like in Windows 8 because that's where we started last year when we first started tackling search. Um, we, we looked at what we had, and then we looked for ways of how we could make it great in Windows 8.1, and that's the next part. And then the third thing is I'm actually going to show you how easy it is using the improvements we've made to the platform and also um, the power of Visual Studio templates to go from nothing to a full search experience, which can be just as great. So let's start with search in Windows 8. Windows 8 was provided the single search box to be able to search your apps, your settings, your files, and even within apps themselves. So if you were here in the travel app, you would go to the charms, um, and then you would start entering your search query, and suggestions would show up above the other scopes that you could have switched, switched to to get to your apps, files, and settings. And then once you submitted your search, you'd be back in the app showing the results. So the very first thing we did when we were stepping back and looking at what we did in Windows 8 was, well, what are the things that are really popular with users? What are the things that are really resonating? And what are the things that we could look to improve? Well, what does it all mean? So the first thing that really resonated with people is that search was always there. From any point in the system, you could quickly bring out the charm, and you could start to launch an app, or you could launch a setting, or you could get to a file, or you could search the internet by switching scopes to the Bing app or the Internet Explorer app. The second thing was how amazingly fast it is to launch an app with a keyboard. All you have to do is hit the Windows key, and you're on the Start screen, and just start typing, hit Enter, and you have your app. There's, there was no equivalent for that for touch, but on the hardware keyboard, being able to get what you wanted launched that fast was very, very popular. And so if we looked at those two things, be the search being available everywhere and being able to launch apps really fast, and those were two of our very resound, resounding pieces of positive feedback, the common thread was that they, were both, they both let users do the thing they wanted to do now very fast. Users love search when it's efficient. And this might seem obvious, but it's a great way to sort of frame um, a, a design investigation, which is what we were starting on with search. If a user decides at some point what it is that they want to do, what we can do as software designers, our job, is to help them get to that thing as fast as possible. And search is the way to do it. The whole design language around Windows Store apps, um, it's all about bringing your content first. And um, in, the, in the talk that preceded this one, um, where we talked about the hub pattern, for instance, it's a great way to explore and discover. What search is, what search is great at, is getting you specifically to the thing that you already know you want to get to. And so then, if we're designing the very best search experience, we knew what we had to do. And that was remove as many roadblocks as possible so that a user can get what they want as soon as they've decided that they want it. So in Windows 8, the search box was doing a lot of things. It was searching the system, and it was searching within apps. And as part of that, the result was you could do certain things fast, but if you wanted to search for a setting, for instance, or if you wanted to search in a different app, you would first have to go to the search charm and choose what scope you wanted to search in. And already, that was one roadblock that we knew we needed to remove if we really wanted to make the most efficient search that any platform had ever seen. So let's take a look at what the search experience is now. I'm just pressing WinS, and I can immediately search everywhere. 
So the first thing I'm going to do is just launch an app. So I'm going to launch the sports app. And just like that, from anywhere in the system, I can do that. Now I'm browsing around the sports app, and I'm deciding that I wanted to play some music. So I'll press WinS again. I can also just swipe out from the right, hit the search charm. And now I'm going to play Fits in the Tantrums, which I have on my PC. And so now the music would automatically just start playing without me having to leave the sports app. And you could imagine just going around and playing your songs as you're going along or playing albums or playing artists without having to do anything. Similarly, if I decided that I wanted to um, just check, check the Microsoft stock price that I've checked before, I can do that. And the suggestion right here, I can take it, and it takes me straight to the finance app to do that. So that's kind of the thing that I'm talking about, where people really liked the one thing we could do like this in Win 8, which was launch apps. And in Windows 8.1, you can now do so much more, and it's so much faster. You don't even have to change context to the start screen. You can just bring out the search charm. But let's say what I want, the quick action that I have, isn't here. As I'm typing, I'm getting suggestions straight from Bing. So the first part, the, fir the actions that we were seeing above, those are helping me get to the exact result that I want. What, what, what's happening below here is search suggestions, so I don't have to type quite as much. And now I'm going to choose fits in the tantrums. And now what I'm seeing, unlike in Windows 8, where I would have had to choose the file scope in order to find my files, here I get just search fits in the tantrums. And I'm immediately seeing pictures that I took when I saw them at the Crocodile in Seattle last year. Um, I, that was a pretty good show, and I'm just remembering that. If I'm also seeing a bunch of uh, music that I have on their, um, have, I have stored on my PC. Now, this is all from the first album that they, that they released. Um, but actually what I'm looking for is not in this list. I don't see it here. So instead, it's, it's um, shown in this next section. And this is the search hero. The search hero is the most crafted and most functional top result that you're going to find in any search experience. What it's doing is it's providing me information that I, that I might want at a glance, and also letting me do the thing I want to do without me having to drill into anything, without me having to make a, a decision about where I want to explore. And if I make the wrong decision, I'd have to go back. I can see the albums, and I can see the videos. I can see images and drill into that. But then as I go farther, now I'm seeing web results. And these aren't web results like you've seen them elsewhere. We're showing you screenshots, and we're showing you titles and URLs and descriptions. And all of this, it's not just to look pretty. The reason we're doing it is so that a user can make an informed decision about which one they want. And the reason is because if they choose right on the first try, that means they've gotten to what the thing they wanted to get to as fast as possible. And that was our design principle. And that's what's going to make a user really love this experience. When I tap on the first web link, it doesn't actually take me to Wikipedia's website. It's taking me to Wikipedia's app, because that is the best place to view content on a Windows, on a Windows PC. So I mean, this is great. The reason that we were able to do this, and the reason we're going to have the flexibility to continue to make it better, is because for Windows 8.1, this was one single dedicated search experience. And with that comes flexibility, where we could really optimize what's happening in the pane when you first tap on the search charm. And you, we can really optimize what's happening on the results when you're looking at, these smart, at this smart search. So, So that's how we were able, when, in, during our design process, we're able to use this flexibility to really optimize for fast, to optimize for being able to get the user to specifically what they want, whether it's launching an app, playing some music, um, going, drilling, into one of their, uh, drilling into specific content in one of their apps, launching a file. We could do that all really fast with the flexibility of knowing exactly what our search was supposed to be about and to be great at. So smart search is the best way, the fastest way, for searching Windows and across the web. Now, when, when I've talked to people um, at this conference, and people have uh, talked to me about smart search and said, this looks great, how do I plug in? How do apps plug in? Well, this is something you're going to hear a lot more about later on, um, later in the year. But um, I wanted to give you guys a preview of what you could expect. The first is app mapped web results. And this is something like what you saw with, um, when I clicked on the Wikipedia link, where it was a web link, and it was being returned in, in the order that a web link would be returned in. Um, but 
instead of taking to the website, it's going to take, take the user to the app, which is the better presentation and the better experience for experiencing that content on a Windows device. And if you have a popular website, if, you're, if your website is, is crawlable um, right now via search engine, then this is going to be a candidate. Um, the second is search contract integration. In Windows 8, there was very deep search contract integration with the search charm, where we would show the entire list of all apps that had ever signed up for the contract. What we found is that 93% of users who switched, switched between IE, the store, apps, files, and settings. So while it, would have been, it was a really great idea to have, um, to have users be able to jump and switch between all the different apps that support the search contract, they weren't really doing this. And the reason was because it was too long of a list. It was hard to find the right apps that you wanted to switch to. And so the way that search contract integration will eventually work in, the, in Smart Search is that Bing will, based on relevance, return entry points um, to search results for apps that are going to be great for that query. So for instance, if I am searching for a shopping, if I'm searching for a digital camera, and you know, there's some, some web results, but really the most interesting results are going to be deep inside of apps. So that's when shopping apps that I have installed on my system will come up with an entry point to go launch a search inside of that app. And lastly is hero integration. Heroes are, heroes are the part of smart search that we are most proud of. And it's because it is the absolute most relevant and most beautiful first answer that you'll find on any search experience across any platform or on the web. And we're committed to keeping it that way. And so that means if there is an action or if there is a, a piece of information that is core to being at the top relevance for a given query, then it's our responsibility to make that integration happen. And so that's something we're going to watch watch evolve um, over the next year as users are using um, smart search, seeing how they use it, and seeing what's necessary to keep the hero at the top and be the best results that you'll find on any platform. So all of that, smart search, that's how my team took the goal of, make, of efficiency and, and taking the flexibility and making it as fast as possible. But let's see how, apps took, how the apps in Windows 8.1 took on that challenge. So if we look in the mail app, you'll see that unlike in Windows 8, there's a search presence on the apps canvas. And when I interact with it, a search box shows up immediately above, um, immediately above the message list. And further, as I'm typing, I will be able to scope it, because I know I'm looking for a mail from Frank. And I know that it's not in my inbox, because I clear my inbox every day. So even before I query anything, I can change the scope of it so that once I search, the mail I'm looking for is right there. In Windows 8, what would have happened is I would have had to enter a query as is in the search charm. Then I would have come back and said, oh, hey, there's no mails from Frank, or this mail that you wanted from Frank isn't in your inbox. And then maybe I would have had another button to say, maybe I should search in all folders. So, Having the flexibility to control the end-to-end -end search experience is what's allowed this experience to be as fast as it can be and get, get me to the content I was looking for as fast as possible. Now let's look at the reading list and see what they did. Now in the reading list, um, I've saved a bunch of articles that I wanted to read later. And right now, I want to find an article about the Seahawks 49ers rivalry that I saved a few weeks ago. So I'm going to start typing C, Seattle. And before I even get to the T, I can see that the audio clip that I'm looking for about the 49ers versus Seahawks is right there. And it's presented in a way that's familiar to me, um, not as a generic search result. Um, and it filtered down such that I didn't even have to finish typing. Now, we made a lot of typing improvements on the soft keyboard in Windows 8.1. But whether you're using a soft keyboard or a, or a hardware keyboard, the fewer characters you have to type, the better, and the faster that is. And so. The reading list had the, um, in the reading list app, we had the, f the flexibility to tie together the experience of the results and entering your search term. And when you put those together, you end up with a huge efficiency. So the in-app search box is the fastest way to search inside of your app because of the flexibility that you get with it. And I keep talking about flexibility. Um, here's kind of specifically what I mean with that. 
unlike in Windows 8, search happens all on the same app surface, all in the same place. So there's full, so it, by keeping the user in context, already it will feel more efficient and it will feel faster. You're able to have specialized query building. So that was a small example in the mail app. A uh, more significant example might be if you're building a real estate app or if you're building a shopping app, where if I'm a home buyer, I know in advance that I'm looking for a condo in the city rather than a three bedroom house in the suburbs. If I can filter that up front, then it's way more likely that the first set of results I get are going to be very relevant to me. And again, that is the goal of search, getting me to the thing I want as soon as I want it. There's now the flexibility to create a very predictable search experience. With the user being able to see the search box and see details about it, um, like, like little things about where it's positioned or what hint text it has, will go a long way in helping users be fast. And then lastly, tailored results. If you looked at the results in the reading list, and you looked at the results in the mail app, and you looked at the results in smart search, they're all formatted very differently, but they're all formatted and they're all laid out to give me as much information early on as possible and to give me as quick access to the correct answer soon. But here's the good part. In addition to having this additional flexibility, there's still all the great efficiency features that we built into Windows 8. All of that is still here in Windows 8.1. And you can take advantage of that with the new search box control that we've added to the WinJS and XAML platforms. It has the efficiency features of Windows 8 and the flexibility that you'd expect of any in-app control. And so when you put those things together, it's going to allow you to create a search experience that is as stunning and as, and, and as impressive as the smart search experience that we built for Windows 8.1. So let's walk through some of those efficiency features. Search history is one of them. Something that we've seen over and over and over again is that users, and this is across all, do all search domains, whether you're launching an app or searching Bing or searching within um, an app, is that users will, will, ex will, will run the same searches multiple times. And maybe this seems counterintuitive, like why do, you keep, why do you keep going back looking at the same things? But it's, if you think about it, it makes sense. Generally, users have some set of apps that they like to use a lot. So that means that every time they're launching an app, they're typing one of these few things. Um, if you were writing some code and, and you're using a new API that you've never used before, the first time you're probably going to you know, search around until you can find it. And then you click on that link, and then you have the API docs. And then you're done with it, so you close it. But then you want to check it again a few hours later you're probably just going to enter that query, that last one, that got you the right result. And then you're going to click that first link, and then you're going to be back at the API doc. I mean, you could have used bookmarks. You could have, saved, you could have kept the window open. But what our data tells us is that people don't. People just run the search again and again and again. If you're searching inside of an app, if search is the quickest way to find some specific content, then it'll always be the quickest way, whether the first time or the last time. And so that's why people keep going back. And that's why the search box built in will remember the searches that users um, enter into it. And without you having to do any work at all, it will be preserved and suggested to the user. Result suggestions are my favorite kind of suggestion. Uh, the result suggestions that we use in the, um, in the search pane for the search when you bring out the search charm is the app suggestions and the music suggestions and the stock suggestions, the ones that let you get to where you're trying to go instantly. And that's what result suggestions do. They, they bypass the search results page. And remember, our goal is making search as fast and efficient as possible to get users to where they want to go. So this is like the holy grail because we're cutting out the middleman entirely and getting them right where, right where they're, right, right to write what they're after. And then we have query suggestions. And the point of this is to reduce typing. If you can type three characters and get your, the full query string that you're trying to enter, well, that's a big win for users. So here's some tips that we've, that we've learned in designing our experience. One is that always put, our, put your result suggestions above, any, above query suggestions. And this is similar to how in the search charm we put the um, quick actions at the very top. Because they are the ones that are going to save the most time. And they're also way more specific, and there's way fewer of them. So that means the more you type, they're going to go away anyway. And this way, if what I'm looking for is at the top, if I type MSFT and I want to launch the stock quote, I just have to push down once. 
to get to that result, press Enter, and then I've got it. If it were at the bottom of the list, I'd have to press down a whole bunch of times. And then we're removing that efficiency that the result suggestion can really offer. And then the last thing is about putting separators between different types of suggestions. And that's true in this example of result suggestions and query suggestions. But let's say you were building a music app and you wanted to differentiate between album suggestions, artist suggestions, uh, song suggestions. Um, the reason that's it's great aesthetically to, to, to separate out the list, but its primary use is in efficiency. Because if a user can parse the list faster, that means they can get to the suggestion they want faster. And I keep bringing this back, because that's what this is all about. I love this feature. Um, in, in the team, we call it type to search. Um, and it's a, it's a little thing. Um, and it works. it's just for people with hardware keyboards. But it works really well where all you have to do, if type to search is enabled on the search box, is just start typing. You don't have to click inside the search box. You can just start typing, and a, and a search will, will begin. And then you just hit Enter, and you're at your search results. This is the thing that works so well on the Start screen um, in Windows 8, which is that without even having to open, click on Search anywhere, you could just start typing CMD Enter, and then it would launch Command Prompt, for instance. Just a note about, about type to search. It's a great efficiency feature. The place where you'd want to avoid using it is if you have more than one text box on the same page. And one of them is a search box, and one of them is something else. Because what that's going to do is create confusion for the user about where the text is actually going. And as soon as the user has to stop and think, it's no longer as efficient as it would be. We saw on the reading list um, how, how, how we use the flexibility there um, in tying together the search um, box and the search results, filtering as you type. This can be really powerful and really feel fast, and it could really help save you a whole lot of typing. It's difficult to get this right, because what you need is, one, a result set that's going to filter down very quickly. After a few characters, you really want it to be to a handful of results that you can process. Otherwise, you're going to be typing a long query anyway. And two is that it needs to be responsive. You saw on the reading list, we were filtering pretty instantly. On the start screen, the same thing happens. If it's not instant, let's say you're making a web service call every time a user types a character, then what users are going to end up doing, without even thinking about it, is they're going to type a character, and they're going to see the UI update. So they're going to wait for it. And then they're going to update. It's like, no, that's not what I want. So they'll type another one. It's like, wait for it to update. It's like, oh, nope, still not. So maybe in the end, they only have to type three characters, but it's going to take them like a minute to, to get the results. And that's not fast or efficient. Um, I should note that if you're not going to use filtering UI because of that, just use result suggestions and let them type a full query if it's not there. And that's a great way to do it and, and very traditional. This next tip, um, it's great to have a lot of suggestions. And it's really great to have a lot of suggestions that are relevant. As soon as the user doesn't want a suggestion there, it's a nuisance. So offer the user a way to clear their history. Um, there's all sorts of reasons why a user might want to do this. And put a button in your search set, in your, in your settings, in the settings charm, to clear the history. There's a WinRT API to be able to do that. And then the search box won't show that, the, any previous history after that point. So I, I briefly mentioned before the importance of predictability. And a lot of people, when they think about predictability, they're like, OK, yeah, predictability, consistency, all that stuff is good for a new user who doesn't really know how to use it. But you know, like for any power users, and power users use search, um, it's, it's you know, a little less important. Predictability is the most important efficiency feature. Think about touch typing versus hunting and pecking. Touch typing is super fast, because you don't have to think at all. You can just go. And the reason you can just go is because you know really, really well where all the keys are. And you can predict that. And you can predict what's going to happen on screen when you just move your, move your fingers. Same thing is true for any other UI feature. And I'm talking about this in the context of search. And there's a lot of things the search box control provides to help with that. But it's true of all of your UI. Whereas if a user knows exactly what to expect, they're going to be able to be more efficient. And so the things that the search box does to help with this is you can set placeholder text. You can set positioning. And you can make search always available in the same way. So let's take a look at the sports app. Take a look in the top right. There's a search box, and it says, enter a team or player name. So right off the bat, there's two things here. One is I knew where to look, because the top right is the default for where search boxes go, not only in most, most of the apps in Windows 8.1 um, that, that come with the OS, but also even on across the web and in other places. And two, 
I know what I can search in this box. I can search a team. I can search a player. I cannot search for a league, for instance. And I'm not even going to try. I'm not going to try typing, you know, Major League Baseball, enter, and then being sad I don't get results. I know ahead of time that I can't do it. And so that predictability right there is saving me a step and saving me some disappointment. Now, here's an app in the mail, in the mail app where there was a reason to not put the search box in the top right. And it's not just because there were already buttons there. The reason here is that there's a number of scopes that you could theoretically search if you were you know, searching this. Maybe you're searching, it would search your folder list. Or maybe it would, search, it would do a find inside of the, your current mail. Well, what's actually happening is it's searching your message list, like most mail apps. And without even having to think twice about it, you don't even need hint text. Based on this positioning, it is incredibly clear that it is going to be searching over the message list. And that's just a really small change to make, but intentional positioning, being intentional with where you put it, can go a long way to making it obvious to the user what's being searched. A few sessions ago in this room, uh, Sarah gave a talk about um, how to adjust your app to various screen sizes. It is so important for search that it be always available. You don't want a user having to have to rotate their device or having to resize their app just so they can get to search. Because remember, search is about efficiency. If we have to, if you, if you have to take this extra step in order to get search, then we've already failed. And we already are not doing as good a job as we should be in designing a great search experience. So I'm just going to show you really quickly, if we go back to the finance app, for instance, here's the search box in the top right. If I shrink it. The search box has reduced down to just the search button. And when I click it, it the, the, the search box um, shows up again and expands and covers up the title. So now I can you know, enter my search, and it works just the same. So it doesn't matter what screen size I'm in, what orientation I'm in, whether I'm full screen on a 30-inch monitor or half screen on your new Acers. In all cases, search should be available. So I've talked to you now about what we did in Windows 8.1 with Smart Search, how we really optimized for efficiency and how we really took advantage of the flexibility that we got. And I've talked to you about how that can map to your in-app experience and about the new search box control. And now I want to show you just how easy it is to get it implemented. So what I've done here is I've built an app that this is just like indexed the build sessions that we've all been seeing for the last few days. And it's pretty simple. You can just like drill into a session. You can see the list of all sessions. And all of this session data is indexed by the local indexer, uh, by the Windows indexer. We've added to, um, a new API set um, this, um, for Windows 8.1 where you get all the power of the Windows indexer in re like you would have retrieving files. Um, previously, but instead you can now just um, push content directly into it. You don't have to drop files in, in the user's known folders. And so that's what I'm doing here. I'm, I'm pushing this data into the indexer. So all of the retrieving that we're going to be doing is going to be from the indexer. And you can look up more about those APIs after the session. So the very first thing we're going to need to do is add a search box because if I'm trying to find a very particular session, browsing through that big, long list that I was showing before is actually going to be really hard. So the first thing we're going to do is head down to our default HTML file. And this, this whole demo is in WinJS. It's just as easy to do from XAML. So this project has a shared header. Um, so every page is going to use the exact same header. So we're going to add that to to right here. So I'm going to be using Visual Studio snippets, so you don't have to watch me type a lot. And what I've just added is the search box control, and I've set one option on it, which is setting the placeholder text to um, be search build sessions. So it's unambiguous what it is you're supposed to use this search box for. And now we're just going to add some styling. And this styling is pretty straightforward. All it is is placing it correctly in the upper right um, using the grid that's already been defined for the header. And then the rest of this is really just, um, is really just colors and 
opacities and making it fit in with the look and feel of the app. So there it is. It has the placeholder text. It's obvious what's going to be searched over. And I now have a predictable search box. So now I want to search for all the Windows phone settings, all the Windows phone sessions that, we're, that we have. Um, it's not hooked up yet, so nothing's going to happen. Let's hook it up. The first thing we're going to want to do is actually create our results pages. So we're going to add a new folder. Call it search. And then we're going to add a new item. And it is going to be the search results template from Visual Studio. And now we're going to want to hook it up so that the search box actually sends the search over to the search results page. So all of the code we're going to write for the search box is going to be in this search box helper class that I have. So the first thing we need to do then is initialize that. And we can do that right here. Now, in our search box helper class, we're going to respond to, event, to an event that the search box fires called query submitted. This gets fired every time a user submits a query, whether it's by pressing enter, pressing the search button itself, or choosing a query suggestion. So we're going to handle query submitted. And this is pretty straightforward. We're attaching an event handler for query submitted onto the search box control. And then we're just going to navigate to the search results page. We're going to pass in the event, de or the event details, which has the query text in it. So now if we run that, and if you notice, we didn't write any suggestion code at all. The history suggestion is already showing up because I searched this once before. Um, that's what I meant when I said totally free. I meant actually free. Um, all right. So we're on the search results page. And clearly, there's some UI stuff to clean up. But we do know that the query was properly passed to the search results page. And so now let's actually get the search results hooked up to our own data and cleaned up so it looks good. So we'll start on the HTML. And so we'll go into Pages, Search, HTML. Now, there's a couple things we'll have to do here. One is, like I mentioned, there's a shared, head shared header for this project. So we don't need a specific one for this page. So we can just delete that. And two, um, it's great that it said no results match found, but we're going to be adding some data. So we're going to hide that by default. Um, and then the next thing we're going to do is we're putting in our own data. So instead of this boilerplate item template, we can put in our own item template that will be used for the list view that's displaying the results. And now that we have a new item template, we're going to want to style that. So we'll just head to the bottom here. And we'll delete all of this styling that came with the template for the default item since we replaced the item. Delete that. And again, this, this is all just styling like spacing and margins and padding, um, opacity and that sort of thing. There's nothing magical here. So now we get to the fun stuff where we actually just hook up our search results. And there's a lot of code in here that comes with the Visual Studio template. Most of it is exactly what you need. And there's only a few places where we need to plug in our own custom data. So we're going to search for any of the to dos in the file. This function is to update layout. So when the screen size changes, how do you want to reflow in order to properly adjust? We're not going to deal with that here. Um, so we're going to pass over it. The next is this, the Visual Studio template comes with filters. So if you have a really large set of data and you want to help the user quickly filter down to the set that they want. Now, there aren't that many build sessions. There's 160 or so. Um, so we're not going to need any filters to filter down. So we're just going to delete that. Moving on, this is the part where we would set the title and the subtitle to be what we wanted it to be. And as I mentioned before, there's a shared title in this project. So we don't need that. But what we do need to do is set the title that our shared header can pick up. Next up is the item invoked function. And what that does is, as it sounds, when you select a search result, what's going to happen? Well, what's going to happen is we're going to navigate to the item detail page, and then we're going to pass in the selected item data. Now, moving on, we get to search data. And this is kind of the meat and potatoes. This is where we actually get, like, connect our data source to the search results. And so this is all pulling from boilerplate data that comes with a template, and we don't need any of it. So instead, 
we are going to, I've, I've written a helper function to help um, pull data from the indexer, since that's what I'm using to store this data. If you were using a web service, then that's what you would put here to get the data based on the query text. And it's just taking the results and returning a list. Now, the one, th the one extra thing we're going to have to change here is because we've changed search, search data from being a synchronous call, as it was in the template, to, to calling an asynchronous uh, function to get from our data source. And I suspect if you're using a web service, then you'll probably be asynchronous too. So we're going to go to the place where it was called from. And we will replace this code with code that expects asynchronous. So this is pretty straightforward. Just calling the search data function, passing in the query text. If the list is empty, showing the error message, and otherwise binding the list view to our, to our data source. All right, so now that we've done that, let's see how it works. Now, it still remembers that we searched Windows Phone before. And now I searched it, and there we have it. That only took, um, I don't know, a few minutes, and we went from having no search at all to being able to get results. But I don't think that's enough, because this is the bare bones functionality. But like we talked about, the efficiency features are where we really get some wow. So let's start, adding by, let's start by adding suggestions. So let's head to our search box helper class. And we've handled one event, the query submitted event. Now let's handle a second one. And we're going to handle an event called suggestions requested. So what happens here is the search box will fire an event every time the user types. And when that happens, they're going to say, OK, I'm about to show suggestions. What should I show? And so all we have to do is basically take the search suggestions collection from the event details and populate it with suggestions that we want to populate it with. So we're going to start with query suggestions. And what we're doing here is we're calling into our data source, in this case the indexer, and retrieving suggestions based on the query text. And then we're iterating through the, the suggestions that we get to a maximum of 10, um, because we don't really want or need um, a whole long list of suggestions. Once it gets too long, it's unmanageable for the user. However, we can do more than five, which was the limit. We can do as many as we want. Um, five was the limit in the search pane, because it was sharing space with the system search also. Um, all right, so now we've got query suggestions. And let's see how that goes. So now when, I'm, when I first click in the box, I just, get, I just get history suggestions. But now when I'm typing, I'm actually getting um, query suggestions based on the data. So now we can find all of the Windows 8.1 sessions. And now I can even search individual speaker names. So I want to see the session that is happening tomorrow about Windows Phone. And there's just one result. So this is OK. It's great that there's just one result. But this is really where a result suggestion would come in handy, because we can skip that whole step and get the user straight to the details page that they want to get to. So let's add our result suggestion. So this works exactly the way the query suggestions worked, um, where we're going to call into retrieve result suggestions list. Um, we're going to call into indexer helpers, get our result suggestions based on the query, iterate through the list that we're getting back, and adding them one by one to the suggestions collection. Um, and result suggestions, we only we have a maximum of two because it's such a larger set. All individual results is such a large set of things that we could show. If we showed all of them, the user would have no way of choosing between them. At that point, they're better off just seeing a results page. So we're keeping it limited to one or two, just our best, ge our absolute best guesses of what the user probably wants. And the next thing we're going to do is remember that result suggestions should be on top, not on bottom. So we are moving our query suggestions down below. And then we're also going to put a separator in between, because we're having two different types of suggestions. And for this, we're just saying, if there are result suggestions and there are query suggestions, then append a separator that is labeled suggestions. Now there's one other thing we're going to have to do. And that is because our result suggestions are coming back asynchronously, but suggestions need to be appended synchronously. So we are going to wrap this in a promise. In XAML, you would request a deferral. And once that is done, 
then actually That was the problem. Oh, that could be it. So. Well, I will join the elite club of people who have had demo stumps. There we go. We go. All right, this is not going right. So instead, what we are going to do is close this out, and we're just going to. We're just going to grab the working copy of search results helpers. All right, so last we left this app, we were searching for Sean, and we were getting a search results page with just one, and now what we're getting is a query suggestion that actually takes you to the suggestion. And the reason that's hooked up is because we copied in the file, so now I'm just going to quickly show you what was happening there. There's another event called results suggestion chosen, and what that does is it, it takes the the identifier for the result that was actually picked, and then it looks up the item details, and then once that's happened, it will simply navigate to the results page with those item details. Um, and when you have all that working, then what you get is this, ex this full search experience where you're able to type, you get result suggestions, you get query suggestions, and you can immediately go to any of them. So that took us uh, probably about 10 minutes, maybe, to go from no search at all to having um, a full-fledged search experience. And so now, let's just spend another couple minutes adding some of the extra features that will really make this efficient and really make this powerful. So the first thing we're going to do is go back to our HTML, and we're going to add one more option in addition to the placeholder text. And that's focus on keyboard input. And this is what's going to enable, that's what's going to enable type to search. Then, we're going to add the code to be able to adjust to window sizes. So in addition to just the search box, what we'll need is a search button that we can use. So that's just um, creating an element, and we're going to style it just like the search button that's used by the search box. Now we just should add some CSS for that new search glyph. And we're going to add a media query, which is going to listen for when the app is small, and in which case, toggle between the search box and the search button. So the search glyph is hidden by default. It's positioned in exactly the same way that the, search the button for the box is positioned. And finally, when, when the window is small, and in this case, I'm picking 768 pixels, but um, it's really when you relay out your app for narrow, or when you think that the search box is going to start overlapping with the title, then uh, you'll want to toggle between the search box and the search button. And so then the last thing we have to hook up, the last thing we have to hook up are event listeners, um, and we can go back to our helper class to do that, for, 
for when to switch, when to essentially set the class that allows the CSS to toggle between the two controls. So when you click on the button, then we're going to add the expanded class, and that's how the CSS knows to show the expanded search box. And when you click off of the search control, then that's how it knows to remove the expanded class and thus go back to showing just the button. So let's run that. Now let's collapse this, and you'll see that there's a search box that then collapsed down. If I want to um, search now for Windows Azure Sessions, I can do that, and it all just works, and you don't have that conflict between the title and, and the box. And then if, I'm going, if I go back to the home page, even here, I don't need to click inside of the text box. I can just start typing. I can hit um, one letter, go to a res result suggestion, and get to the details. And that's efficiency. And that, this whole thing, using the Visual Studio template and using the new search box control, did not take very long. And we have a very polished and efficient uh, search box experience. So let's get out of full screen mode. So that's taking an app that has no search and moving it to an app that does have search. What about when you're moving from an app that has search already? It's using the Windows 8 search contract. And how do you move it to using the search box and getting the flexibility that comes with that? It's really easy. And we spent some time really making sure that it's easy. Um, you would basically, all of the events between search box and search pane are identical. So instead of attaching the event listeners to the search box control, just attach it to the search, or sorry, instead of attaching them to the search pane, attach it to the search box control, and then you're done. Some of the event, um, the event details have changed a little bit to be more consistent with how controls in general work, but um, it doesn't take more than one or two minutes to actually just go from having a search pane implementation to having a search box implementation. And then you get all the flexibility and all the extra features associated with the search box control. If you aren't planning on making any updates really to your app at all in the near future, but you're hoping to a little later on, in the meantime, add a button which will launch the search pane for the user. And I'll show you why, why you would want to do this. So if I bring up the search pane and I'm going to launch, I have a version of, well, OK, let's launch. I have a version of this project which, instead of using the, instead of using the Win8 contract, or instead of using the search box, it used the Win8 contract. And if we run that, you'll see you'll see that if I go to the search charm like I would have in Windows 8, by default, it's scoped everywhere. By default, it's going to, to run a smart search. And if the user wants to run a search inside of an app, then you would go and pick search, um, build sessions and then you can run a search and get all your suggestions as you, as you were used to. In order to maintain a fast experience for your users, you'll want to have a button in the app which will launch the pane. And I'll show you an example of an app that does that. If you launch Hulu, for instance, even in their Windows 8 app, they had a search glyph on Canvas which would launch the pane. And when you do that, it automatically scopes it to the app. So adding this button not only gives you some flexibility around the positioning and such, it also lets a user get straight to searching from within the app. Given how easy it is to actually just add a search box, I'd recommend that that's the route that you take. But if, you don't, if you, it doesn't fit in your UI, obviously, and you're not redesigning right now, then um, add, add the button. And doing that is really easy. You can just create the element. And you can, if you're doing this on 8.1, you can add um, you can reuse the style we're using for the search box for the button, and just you can call the WinRT API on the search pane to show it. Um, if you're doing this on Windows 8, and you can and should do this on Windows 8, um, you, can, you can use this styling to style it just like our search button, or you can use whatever styling you like um, to get to let the user know that this is search. So we've spent a bunch of time talking about half the story. We've talked about what it takes to help the user enter their query, enter their search term as efficiently as they can, essentially telling the app what it is they want. And you know, we do our best with result suggestions to be able to get them straight to the thing they want immediately. But many times, that's not possible. Many times, they're going to see search results pages. And that's OK. 
So let's talk about how we can really optimize this to make this as efficient an experience for users as possible. How do we make it so that they can get from search results now to the exact specific piece of content that they want very, very quickly? So this was our results that we were using for the Build Session app. Um, it's OK. It's functional. Here I searched Windows Phone, and I'm getting a bunch of Windows Phone sessions. It's nice. Um, but the problem is that if the one that I want isn't in the very top left, then I'm not really sure where to look next. Because the, first, the top left is obviously the first and most relevant result. But I'm not actually sure what comes after that. And we have, actually have some experience with search results in this layout. Um, it's, this layout is really great for being able to browse content where it doesn't really matter what's first and second and third and fourth because you're just looking around and seeing what strikes your, strikes your interest. But if you're trying to find something specific, then relevance matters a lot. And this was, this was roughly the layout we used in the Bing app in Windows 8. And when we did some eye tracking on it, here's what we found. Take a look in the top left. That means that that was the first place that everyone looked. That's awesome. Like They looked at our, at our most relevant result, and that's exactly what we wanted. But see the long lines that are cutting across from those first dots in the top left? Some are going to the bottom right. Some are going to the top left. Some are going to the bottom left. Those lines represent where they looked after they saw the very first result. That's really bad. Because the second most relevant result is not in the bottom right, and it's not in the top right, and it's not in the bottom left. And if it were consistent that it was going from the top left to the bottom right, say, we could just put our second most important search result in the bottom right. But there was no consistency at all. Everyone was doing something very different. Compare that to the eye tracking we did on an early version of, of the smart search layout. Here we were asking them to look up a definition for this medical term. And the eyes um, typically jump straight to the result that it was. And if it wasn't, if a user looked at the other ones first, with this page, then users were seeing the top three results. And our Bing data tells us very, very strongly that the top three results are very, very often the right results. So this design was specifically um, tailored to be able to get users to the most relevant results without any ambiguity or distraction. And here's the best part. This is a video from when it's not in the top three, and they're scrolling along. Notice what they're looking at. They're looking at each result in order, and they're examining them. They're looking at the screenshot. They're looking at the title. They're looking at the description. And what that means is that they are looking at our results in relevance order. And that's perfect, because that means they're looking first at our best guess, then our second best guess, then our third best guess. They're not jumping all around, skipping around, and, and hoping to find the right thing, which is exactly what would have happened if we had this giant 2D grid with no indication of where you're supposed to look. Where's, where's the Windows Phone session that I'm looking for? It's not clear. So, you can make a really small tweak to this to start giving the user a way to parse this result. Well, this is all schedule data, right? So maybe instead of just a big block, you can organize it into the, time, the day and time that it is. So here are the things that I get just by looking without even reading a single thing. Well, I know that today's Thursday afternoon, and I don't have any Windows Phone sessions to go to. So I can go and, look, go and see a Windows Azure session or a, or a Windows 8.1 session. Um, I know that um, I am re what I'm actually looking for are the sessions that are coming up tomorrow. Well, now I only have five things to look at instead of this dense 2D grid of things where I'm looking and drilling in and pulling back um, to try and put together my own schedule in my head. These search results are already helping me do this. And finally, that app-to-app -app communication on Windows Phone Talk that I was looking at before is on its own on Friday afternoon, I know ahead of time that it's not conflicting with anything. So that's at-a-glance information I'm getting, and it's also helping me get to the results I want much more quickly. And this is the exact principle that we took when we were designing the heroes and when designing the whole smart search layout. What, what information can we give you at a glance? How can we make it so that you're, um, when you're scanning, you're scanning it in a way that's going to help you get to the right result faster? There's no magic here. It's all about just getting the user to the results as fast as possible. And that's all we did. And it worked out all right. And that's the same thing that everyone here can do with their apps. So when you're thinking about what to do with your results pages, provide at-a-glance information so that users don't even have to drill in, potentially, to get the information that they're looking for. 
pay attention to scan pattern, to how users are going to move through all of your results so that you make sure that when they're moving through it in a methodical way, they're seeing what you want them to see in the order that you see it. You don't need eye tracking for it. All you need to do is see how long it takes someone to really absorb your search results. Show the necessary details to help the user make a decision. When, we were showing web, when we're showing web results in Smart Search, we are showing a screenshot, a big screenshot of, of, the, of the, the website. And we're doing that so that users can make the right decision on the first time and not have to go back and forth between search results and individual results to find the thing that they want. And then lastly, make your results functional and beautiful. There's a difference. If you make it functional, then users will think it's powerful. If you, if you make it functional and beautiful, then users will want to come back over and over and over again and really enjoy, appreciate, and love the app. And then with the search box, use the, use the features and use the benefits of the in-app search control. There fe there's efficiency features built in, like placeholder text and suggestions and type to search. Use the flexibility that you get, like positioning and scoping. And make search available at all times, regardless of what screen size or what orientation or what device you might be on. And then at a minimum, if you're not going to include a search box, at least put a button in, at least put a button in your app to launch the search pane. Some other sessions that you might be interested in, I think at this point all of these has already happened. Um, there was a great talk about making your, your app look great on all device sizes, just like we're talking about with search. For more details on that, you can watch that talk online if you didn't see it. Designing and building user interfaces for Windows. That is a talk that just happened, um, and it was a fantastic talk. It touched on search, but in, the, in general, it's talking about how you can put the level of care that you should into your designs. And that level of care, thinking about personality and animations and motion and all of that, should apl applies just as equally to your search results. And then talking about upgrading from Windows 8 to Windows 8.1, where they show an example of actually um, upgrading, um, changing your search experience. And then, final, and then dramatically increasing performance when users interact with large amounts of data with grid views and list views. Many, many, many search results are based in grid views and list views, and many search results show large amounts of data. Making that as fast as possible is key to having an efficient search experience. And then finally, uh, using the Bing controls to build great Windows apps. There's a lot of great controls coming out of Bing um, that can make your app really powerful and leverage the power of Bing, just like we did with Smart Search. And I encourage you to check that out. There's a bunch of resources that you can look at, including guidelines, SDK samples, and API references um, for the search box and for the indexer APIs that I was talking about before. I encourage you to check those out when you're actually using the control. And so we've touched on a lot of things today, but ultimately we've really only talked about one thing. How can you make search as efficient as possible? How can you make it that as soon as a user decides what they want to do, that you can get them there without any roadblocks at all. And if you can do that, if you can, if you can get the user to the thing they want to do, and not just do it in a way that works, but do it in a way that is beautiful and that really exemplifies your content and brings it out and makes it super fast, then it won't just be powerful. It will be powerful, and it will be stunning. So thank you.